I like pushing my kind of, I don't know, my bubble in my brain. You know, we always get into these kind of, you know, same chats and with a similar minded people. And it's nice to come to somewhere where you're like, actually, let's all just come together. Like you, you said on my show, we're all trying to achieve the same thing. So why should we not all meet and have a chat? That's my, my view. Well, uh, you're quite right, sir. We spent two days sitting on the stage agreeing with each other. So it's, it's nice to have somebody <laughs> who probably won't. Um, so what have you seen of the game fair so far? Uh, the bar. Yeah, I can see that. And that's it. Um, no, no, I have had a wander around very quick because I got here quite late. But um, I've just had a wander around, like kind of just, just <laughs> a lot of tweed. A lot of tweed. A lot of tweed. Um, and that's about it. Have you, have you been to anything like this before? No, never. No. Uh, I mean, it is. You know, it, it has become a retail experience. So you yeah. know, you'll you'll have to have a, a walk around, even even for kind of journalistic reasons later on. Oh, absolutely. With your credit card. Uh, unfortunately just, you know, not. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that doesn't work here. Sadly. Um, <laughs> It, on your side of the fence, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to keep characterising it like that because you know that, that, that's how the media works. Yeah. But uh, I mean, w what shows do you go to that are in any way a sort of a collection of people like this? Don't say Glastonbury. No, I've never been to Glastonbury. <laughs> um, no, I. I've, okay, I'm going to say I've been to Veg Fest, which is literally the the mecca of vegans. But the reason why I go there is purely because you get to see, kind of, um, it's basically a food fair. So if, if you're hungry and there's booze everywhere, that's grand. But to be honest, I don't go to a lot of things like this because I'm just too busy. Like I'm, I'm self-employed. I run the podcast. I run the show. I'm doing more presenting. So it's actually like, genuinely like it is lovely to come to somewhere like this where you are seeing people with, especially after the year and a half we've had, this is the thir first kind of big event I've been to where there's crowds of people. So when I first walked in, I was like, oh, shit. It is a bit of a culture shock or a bit of a mind shock. But it is nice to kind of see people walking around with the similar kind of views and similar kind of like interests and, and just to listen to some of the chats you've been having as well. It's, it's been nice. Yeah, I should warn you, these microphones have their own NHS apps and are being pinged on an almost hourly basis. So be, be, be okay, careful. Yeah, we're going to get pinged. No, <laughs> well, I think the microphone's going to get pinged. I think you'll be all right. <laughs> I think as far as track and trace is concerned, there's huge black holes opened up in uh, Ragley and those are people who walk, suddenly have got, gone dark. And then <laughs> five hours later, they'll all leave. <laughs> all right, now tell me about Into the Wild podcast, which I've been on, so I know a little bit about it already, but how did it start and what are you trying to do with it? Into the Wild started because I think I saw a big opportunity for talking about nature, wildlife and conservation to like the mainstream. I mean, there's stuff on TV, there's stuff for children, but there's never anything for that middle ground, that 18 to 40 year olds. There's, there's very little really that you can pick up your kind of weekly or monthly information about what's going on in the real world, what's going on with wildlife in the UK, in Asia, in Africa, in America. It, it is really hard to try and get, unless you're an academic, or a child, it's very hard to get that information. So I saw an opportunity where I could invite people in the know onto the show and to kind of quiz them about, what well, about anything? Can you, you uh, yourself being on there? It's literally, we don't leave a stone unturned really. And it kind of just started because I was locked down in my flat in London. I thought I've got nothing else to do. So I might as well chat to people. Comedy, I was a stand-up comedian before and I thought, well, that's gone for a while. So I thought, why not just have some chats with people? And it very quickly, became this thing where it's like, oh, there's people that want this. And it's not just nature people, it's people that are just sat in their homes as well that want to hear this information. And then as we carried on and got further and further, and you start talking about conservation, you realise there's some angles that you've never heard about, whether that's trophy hunting, whether it's hunting in this country and how it's managed. And I thought, well, I've never heard about this and I'm really interested in nature. So if I've not heard about it, the rest of the world hasn't. So that's where I decided to start picking up those kind of divisive topics i guess and go well i'll chat about them then and that's those are my favorite topics to talk about <laughs> i don't know why i like putting that chat out there because i think it's fun well they are um, they're, they're going to be controversial for your audience as you know you are controversial for for, for our audience so so what did you find out what, what, what did you start with and, and and what did you learn well it depends what element we're talking about if we're talking about trophy hunting that was because if you'd asked me that question more or less this time last year, I would have said, no, it's horrible. Why would anyone, that, that's not conservation, conservation can't work like that. And then as soon as you leave that bubble of thought and you go, one minute, I'm just gonna challenge my brain a bit. And you talk to people in Africa rather than talking to Born Free or rather than listening to what campaigns to ban trophy hunting have to say, you start to listen to people in Namibia, the uh, you know, local communities that rely on that. You start to think, well, who are we as a country to say, I know maybe you can't do that anymore. Yeah, that's, um, that's unethical. We don't believe in that. But how ethical is it to really take away something that someone relies on for a job, for food, for healthcare, for education? 
And you don't have to like it. I think that's a big thing, especially with something like trophy hunting, or even hunting per se. You don't have to like it. That's the thing. It's what it's doing that you have to kind of look at. So when you look at trophy hunting, and I've really only focused on Namibia at this stage of my research, but you look at it in somewhere like that and you go, you can, unless there's an alternative that can instantly replace what it's doing for not just people, but for wildlife as well, taking that away is going to cause people to go to agriculture more and to poaching to go up because people are still going to want to kill the animals. So you, you, when you start to like kind of look into that, you go, and this isn't as simple as this. You, you can't just go around banning it. And I think that's where on the show I was like, I want to talk to people that live in Namibia. I don't want to have anyone on that is British. I, I want to talk to Namibian people. And we did. And it was just eye opening to how regulated it is to the point of where they will be told how many species and how many individuals within that species they can hunt in that year. Um, and then maybe around Africa, in different countries, like some grey areas where rules are broken, but you know, you can't go in with that attitude of going, rules are being broken. You have to kind of go, well, that's, that's the, the rules and regs. So when you start to look into it, you start to realise, just because I don't like it, doesn't mean it can't happen. And that's something I really, I go, I got passionate about on the podcast, and that's why, that's why I ended up speaking to you. But because we were talking about bird crime in the UK, and I'd spoken to the RSPB, I'd spoken to an ornithologist, and then I got quickly emailed by a few hunters and got told me to stop being so something biased. Um, and I was like, well, I'm not. I'm just trying to learn about a topic. So I thought, well, why not um, learn more? So I contacted my sponsor, who put me forward to yourself. And we had a chat about you know, how it works in the UK. I suppose one of the, uh, the problems we find at, at Field Sports Channel, which is you know, a, a YouTube channel that's shamelessly about uh, hunting and shooting. Um, oh, my goodness, there we go. And uh, how did you get that picture right, so damn quick? Right, you got. You got, you got I got, tweeted that yesterday. That's Aaron over there. He's responsible. <laughs> Good for work, kind of Aaron. Can I hire you for a while? Jesus. Um, the, the the motto of the British television viewer these mm. days, and it's probably worldwide, but it feels British, is "I'll be the judge of that." And yeah. so, if you are presenting stuff that they don't like, they will they will tell you. Or worse, they'll switch off. How do you, how do you cope with that? I mean. I'm dealing with that on Twitter, and Twitter's not got room for nuanced conversation. You've literally got 240 characters to have a chat. You can't, you, you've got to go in with um, a bit of recognition, I think, because I think when I'm talking about hunting, I come from an aspect of, I used to think or say what you're saying now. So I recognize what you're saying. I think there's some acceptance, and I think you need to bring those people in and go, I hear what you're saying, but let me tell you about this. But you also have to be prepared for them to come back with information that may be new to you or you may already know is a load of rubbish but it's what they're going on so i think it's kind of understanding what you're battling against um with something like this and the same when me and you spoke i had my side of information you had yours but we had a great hour and a half chat and we went away going that was fine you know i was i was genuinely i'll be honest with you a bit nervous before our chat because i hadn't I'm oh, terrifying. <laughs> you are terrifying, Charlie. But I'd never spoken to someone who hunts before. I'd, I'd never done that. So I didn't know what we were going to talk. But we really quickly just thought, well, let's put those two opinions over there and just have a chat about the topic. So I think dealing with people switching off, you're not going to deal with that. I think this country, and no offense to anyone sat here now, but in this country, we do have this attitude of going, I know best. Like you said, like, I've got my opinion, and that's fact. And it's like, well, those two things are very different things <laughs> as an opinion, and we're talking about fact. So I think you just have to prepare for that. I, I think we need to be looking at more media, how the media deal with these situations, more honest reporting, more science-based reporting rather than more opinion reporting. I think until we start to get that going into mainstream media, I don't think the public would ever follow because it's too opinion-led. Well, one of the good things about the media at the moment is, I mean, you, you are effectively the kind of find out more button, aren't you? you know? Yeah. So if somebody watches the wild. Press the red button. <laughs> press the red button. And you get Ryan. You get you get into the wild. Yeah. And and, uh, and I suppose then, I mean, then we have a sort of question about things like responsibility. But also one of the good things is the viewer makes up their own mind much more than they ever did. I and mean, mm. we used to be in a world where you would listen to what the BBC told you, and now we're in a world where you sit there and you 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 soak in a lot of information. And then you decide. It, 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 is, is, you're nodding. I'm glad you're nodding. Yeah. I mean, is that a fair appraisal? <laughs> it is. I think, I think it's too easy. Or there's too much information out there. Or there's too much, un, uh, I don't know, fact-checked information out there. So it's very easy to go on Google and put in, uh, you know, pheasant hunting UK and find out all the crap. 
you know, it's very easy to do that. Whatever's being paid on Google the most will come up and the same with Trophy Hunter. So it is hard to find that and that's one of the reasons why Into the Wild started because I wanted people to be able to find reliable information from the horse's mouth and be like, this person knows what they're talking about. This person is from that background. So you can disagree with them, sure. I mean, we did on the show a couple of times, but we know we, you're listening to the chat. It's all about having conversations, you know. As I said, coming together and we, we're, we're all in it. Like, you, you don't want the world to implode. I don't want the world to implode. I don't want animals to go extinct. You don't want animals to go extinct. So you, we may as well come together and have these chats. And it's, it's about putting them out there. Right, so one thing on the stage we've discussed quite a lot. We, we've had some absolutely wonderful people here. Um, uh, uh, that is, people I've heard of. You know, Adam Henson from BBC Country File, Lord Botham. Mm. And, and we talked a little bit about cancel culture. So when you bring up an issue, you know, you have a lot of people who might agree with it, a lot of people who disagree with it, and you now have a, th a new thing where you have people say, well, let's, let's just not even give them the platform. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, the joy of your podcast, the joy of my YouTube channel is we, we, we arrive with our platforms already established. <laughs> but, we, you know, you also, you were a stand-up comedian. You, you have a career. You're part of um, a media kind of ascendancy. Are you worried that by taking what many people consider to be, on, especially on your side, a very unfashionable, very uh, uh, unbelievable view, that, that they will simply blank you out of their, their cultural experience and, and not give you any, uh, any, any other oxygen? Without sounding really cocky, no. Like, I'm genuinely, like, I don't, I'm not doing it to be edgy. I'm not doing it to push but buttons. I'm doing it because I think it's the right thing to do. I think you can stand there and say, we're doing this activity and everything's grand and there can be an alternative party going but that is wrong that shouldn't be happening but you should be coming i just i, I know i'm repeating myself when i say this but it's, it's that coming together so if people get angry about that i'm like well, you're getting angry about me having a chat i'm not out there saying hunting is grand or you should all eat tofu for the rest of your life that is not what i'm saying i'm saying if we don't have these discussions if we don't start we're, we're at a crisis, we're at a tipping point. I don't want to get all vegan and preachy on everyone, but we are at that tipping point where we go, so we've got to do something, especially in the UK. We've not got great land management as it is, in my opinion, and in my uh, research. So something has to be done. And the only way to do that is for us to meet together and to find out what we can actually do. Well, we're at a point of change. I'm going to certainly yeah. go that far. You know, we, we've, we've had a, we've had a, a kind of post-war food security measure in place yes. for the last yeah, 70 yeah. years. And we are in the throes of changing that to a kind of a wildlife management, countryside, broader management phase. So there's, there's, there's a lot up for grabs yeah. at the moment. All right. Um, I know there's at least one vegan in the audience here who, Is that? who's come Kill to the, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> who's come here probably for fun, possibly for loyalty. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say. I'm not going to look at them, otherwise I'll give it away. <laughs> um, could, could you, I mean, when, later on... You can ask me to smell them out. Exactly, that's right. <laughs> Where's the hemp? See if you one they are. <laughs> um, but, you've, but, but later on, we, and we, later on we have got a vegan artist who's going to sit right there, and uh, she went out to stalk a deer to see what it was like. She's a wildlife artist, so she mm. wanted to, to try it out. I want to test your views a bit. Could you see a, a kind of point of contact between yourself and the one for the pot hunter who goes out to... I will use the word harvest, a bird or a deer. It's wonderfully locally sourced. Could you, could you see a point where you would accept that in your own life? You obviously accept another As in life, within my diet? Possibly within your diet. No. Is that because you just want a whole set? You know, you've been collecting <laughs> veganism for a long time. <laughs> no, I, w I, I wouldn't. But genuinely, I'm, I would be worried about eating meat now because I haven't eaten it for so long. Like I, would, I, I reckon I would... I mean, I'd be back and forward to the bog for a long time. I think I've suddenly ate it. Um, but I, I wouldn't, but I don't think that's a bad thing to introduce into society. Okay, so, so it's, it's, it's more about acceptance rather than, you know, you, you yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I choose not to eat meat. My, there's two reasons why I decided to go vegan. One was because I was trying to lower my carbon footprint. I wanted to, it was the easiest way in London to go instantly, reduce your carbon footprint, do something better for the environment. The second reason is because I got the look, so I thought, screw it, if I look like this, I might as well be vegan, everyone thinks I'm a vegan anyway. It was a lot quicker than just correcting people. Does everybody think he looks a bit peaky? Yeah, I thought A so. bit what? A bit peaky. You know. A bit peaky? <laughs> I'm seven pints in, of course I look peaky. <laughs> um, but no, it's, so that, those are the reasons why I went vegan, but I, I don't think, if, if you were to ask me, should the world go vegan? No. 
no, the world should not go vegan because not, the, not everyone here has my life. You know, you have different financial needs, living situations, um, environmental situations. So not everyone should go vegan. But I do think people need to start introducing an education of where their food comes from. So there needs to be more of a We've lost that connection. That's no, you know, everyone knows that. Even if you, you know, if you never think about it, you still know it. You don't know where your meat comes from. So I do think with what you're saying about introducing more, you know, wild shot meat into supermarkets would would be an ideal world. If you get that's the coming together, though. that's what I think is the coming together. Is you can you can have this land that is rich in biodiversity and with shop meat that is supplying supermarkets. Well, that's just I think that's a perfect perfect world for it. Well, in my opinion, you're the uh, edgiest, hardest hitting vegan podcast out there. Well, that's probably just because I've been on it. <laughs> it's not a vegan podcast. It's not a vegan. It's podcast. not a vegan podcast. Okay. Well, 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 how do you what, how do you characterize yourself? It's an environmental podcast. It's a, well, it's a wildlife conservation podcast. Yeah. Wildlife I just happen to be a vegan. Okay, I, I just I can't see beyond that. It's my <laughs> me being blinking. All right, but where where do you want to go next with it? Well, I mean, you've you've already done some stuff that nobody else has done. I mean, when have you ever heard of your side of the argument ac acceptingly taking on trophy hunting? What 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 can you follow? I would really like to chat to someone at Born Free, but they refuse to talk to me at the moment. I really would like to talk to them um, about campaigns that they are pushing, especially because recently Africa, to put it under that title, has literally written them a letter and um, put in a complaint to the UK charity advisor, so I would really like to talk to them. Um, our next big project is we are going to Africa. Um, we've been fully funded to go over and make a documentary talking to local communities and just asking questions about trophy hunting, about, tro uh, about hunting in general, and what their views and opinions are of it. In Namibia? In okay. Namibia, yeah. Yes. That's so we'll be only talking to private landowners, communities, and conservancy members. And hopefully, as soon as COVID lifts any controls, we'll, I mean, we're ready to go. We've just got to wait for the travel. So. Uh, I mean, I, I wonder whether you, you could possibly include one of the anti... I mean, we, we characterise the southern... Uh, hunting countries as the wildlife winners of Africa. You know, they've got all the wildlife. And, yeah. we, and we would say, on my side of the argument, that is because they allow hunting, they allow wildlife management, and, and you know, it's, it gets mm. paid for. And then we look at someone like Kenya uh, as something of a basket case, perhaps no coincidence, the northern white, white rhino died out there, and the southern white rhino is doing pretty well in South Africa, considering. But that is a wildlife loser, Kenya, at the moment. I mean, are you going to characterize it like that, or are you, how, how are you going to... I, th I think, I mean, I, I can only characterise it on what's going on in Namibia because that's where we're going. But I think if you also look at Kenya, K Kenya at the moment has got too many elephants, for example. Their wildlife's doing very well. In some places, not everywhere. In Salvo, definitely. Well, then you've got to remember that elephants don't live everywhere. Like you can't, they can't live, they can only live where there's food, water, and access to move across. Um, so, yeah, they're, 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 I mean, there's issues. I mean, if we look at Europe, you know, there could be healthy wolf populations somewhere and, you know, so we say, you know, wolf populations in Europe are doing grand, but it's like, you, we, I mean, you're starting to look at it as a continent rather than an African country. That starts splitting it up. Everywhere is a different environment. You've got different weather types, different habitats. Um, I mean, even Namibia is on its way to having too many elephants to the point. And when we say too many elephants, we're meaning that the communities are starting to struggle and have crops destroyed and homes destroyed by elephants. That's where we start to class it as too many. Similar in this country with deer and our tree. Um, so my name's Katie Hargreaves. I'm a wildlife artist and I'm also working with some sporting art as well. Um, and I mainly focus on, well, just general wildlife to me. I can't say it's mainly British. It's been British for a while, but I'm also... Paul, can you reach behind her and just, just show, a, show a picture, well, actually, just as an example? Is that fair? Is or is this a, a reveal? This is a present for you, Charlie. Oh, my goodness. It's um, not wildlife, then. Oh, so, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice oh, little it. print for you to say thank you for having me on the show in December. Oh, and, that's uh, right. I did the original for David. Sorry about that. That's fine. <laughs> Paul, Paul, Ryan, you get off. I just want to talk to Katie for now. Thank, <laughs> thank I, I didn't bring so you much. anything at all. <laughs> thank you. Can I, can I accept that very gratefully? So that's absolutely marvellous. I'm guessing that's David on, uh, on the left there. That is there. David, and it's and, you shooting. And me, me shooting, well, mm. just as I always hoped I'd shoot. You see, that's, 
In the, in the in your imagination, you know, you always hope you shoot confetti at birds. Really, that's absolutely brilliant. It, you've captured me and, and David perfectly. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm going to put that there as a reminder. <laughs> um, yeah. So I I do shooting pieces like this, but also wildlife is my main thing. I work in charcoal, so I do a lot of black and white things. I just love using monochrome because I think that there's so much colour in it anyway. So. Why, why need colour? So, um, yeah, and I've been doing it for five years. And I was here five years ago, and I haven't been here since, so it's really nice to be back. And, uh, yeah. How did you discover wildlife as a subject? Why, why wildlife, particularly? Um, well, I've always had a big connection to nature. I'm a country girl at heart, definitely. Um, but my ex-boyfriend was a deer manager, and it all started because I did a present for him of a painting of a fallow buck. And he was like, this is actually really good. Why don't you try a big black and white one? And I was like, that, that'll be rubbish. <laughs> but it's kind of basically all I do now. So um, it turned out pretty good. And yeah, it's just come from there. And I've just developed some skills along the years. And yeah, really Brilliant. enjoying could, it. Could you pass the microphone to Paul? Because yes. I, I, want, I want to bring you in next. Paul, um, you came across Katie because she, she rang you up with a rather surprising proposition that as a vegan, she'd like to shoot a deer. How, how did you feel about that? Um, do you know what? It's quite nice to like, take out people and show them what you do and explain the ethics behind what you're actually doing. And to show that it's not just going out and shooting a deer, it's going out and managing the population and having some good food afterwards, really. So, it, yeah, fantastic sort of result, really. Especially, I think, Katie sort of like can see the whole sort of like cycle of what we do, which is great. Casey, is that the experience you you you, brought, you took away? From, is is that how you felt about what Paul presented to you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, my idea of why I think conservation is important, and therefore I think shooting deer is for conservation reasons, is necessary for their population thriving, you know, and the ecosystem around them. It's not just the deer and. Um, I already made my mind up when I went vegan. I was I had some friends who were. Um, stalkers and they were like yeah but you still support conservation right and I was like well I don't know so I had to educate myself because I was thrust into both worlds at once and so because I was I had to learn like what stalking actually was and why people do it and why people game shoot that's been a, a recent discovery of why game shooting is positive <laughs> I'm not 100% on it but I'm, I'm getting there um, but yeah, so I, I've, from very early on, I had to decide like what my ethics were because of the people that surrounded me. That is important to you, isn't it? D yeah. Making making that choice, making those choices. Yeah, because it's it's a very big decision to go vegan. When you do it, it's just like your whole world feels like it's falling apart, and you're just like, oh my god, like what have I been doing all my life? And I've suddenly realised like I don't want to subscribe to the um, animal farming or use of animals for human pleasure. Um, but understanding that shooting for conservation is a totally different thing. And a lot of people who are anti-hunting or anti-shooting don't understand why it happens. They just see an animal being killed for fun and that's it. And it's really not. So I'm lucky that I've been able to see both sides from friends and people around me. Yeah. Ryan, you're doing a lot of nodding. No, yeah, I agree. I, I agree. Um, I think... Again, and again, hunting is different in every single country, so it's, it's hard to kind of blanket it with, with a conversation about it. But again, I'll journey it back to with trophy hunting is a very similar thing with conservation. I think one of the things that really kind of damages the effects of it is actually um, hunters themselves showing so many pictures of them stood on top of the animal they've killed. And that gets into the access of the mainstream media so quickly that anything you say after that is void to people you're trying to convince. So you could have a picture of a man stood on top of a rhino saying, I've just killed this rhino. And then that is going to upset a lot of people. Like that, that man doesn't care. A lot of people that were around that photo doesn't care. And that's grand. But I think that's something from the other side that we need to start going. Does that need to be out there on social media, on, on these platforms? Because it's actually damaging what the hunters are doing, which is actually a good thing because financially. Well, that's a really interesting question because Paul, among his specialisms, is an expert at making your... Your, the, what you shot looked terrific. The, the trophy yeah. photograph is a thing. And, and I should just, just say that 
although you see, and I completely understand why you see a callous rhino murderer standing on top of a rhino, that rhino murderer has just been driven around that camp for two weeks. He's put about the price of a small farm into that country, and he feels like he's a conservation hero at that point. Although... But I will say, I, I don't see it as that. I can see that photo. I can see that photo and be completely unaffected by it and understand the process. What I'm saying is the mainstream society out there do not. And if we're going to try and get people to step away from Born Free and these campaign organisations that are saying, ban trophy hunting, ban imports, it's not going to work and they're going to have a negative impact within Africa, both for wildlife and communities. That's something. Taking a picture for the hunter themselves, absolutely, that's what they've paid for. Take your trophies, have that. But when you start getting it shared or being sent to these organisations, for these organisations then to share as an anti-view, it's almost like pouring fuel on a fire. It's such an easy tripe for, dare I say, animal rights activists to then go, look what we've got. We can really make it look shit now. And it's, we don't want that. We, we need to get that gone. So I think as much as we need to say to animal rights activists, you know what, it's more complicated than this. I get you don't like pulling the trigger and shooting an animal, neither do I, but I understand the complexities afterwards. As you were saying, you went to go and see it. On the other side of the spectrum, we need to say, you need to calm down with the pictures, lads, because it's, it upsets people. Whether you like it or not, I, you lot here understand I don't like seeing it, and I understand that you don't care. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that you can't put it out there for everyone well, to well, see. Well, no, you know, they, we might care, actually. And Paul, I mean, <laughs> one of your ex... You are an expert at making shot game look amazing. Um, so are you slightly worried about this, or have you seen this trend happening already? Are you already being asked not to take a photograph of the hunter and the deer? I feel it's changed. I've changed um, to how you promote your business now. So you're not just posting a picture of a, a rabbit and grin picture with stood behind the animal smiling. You're not, now it's like showing this, like the whole process. So you, you show the female animals that you're not hunting or whatever you're not hunting. Um, you obviously got the animal you shot. And instead of putting the dead animal in with, a, with, with blood on it, you maybe just do a hoof or an antler. Um, and again, yeah, you find probably a lot of hunters now, a lot of stalks in the UK, I would say probably most of them now are pretty respectful and not posting those type of pictures. I think there's, there's a few, but you're going to get that with every, uh, every industry. But I think, I think people are being more respectful with it and respecting like, the whole um, purpose behind it and you know, that people have got feelings against it and basically try and sort, you know, show it more positive than, uh, than you're going out killing things for fun. Um, so, and I have definitely, I mean, I had some, uh, quite a few problems like four or five years ago with uh, some people who didn't like hunting, antis or what you want to call them. They weren't vegans, they were just antis. <laughs> call them, what do you call them? <laughs> I can't repeat that. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, to be honest with you, I'm quite a confident person and uh, it was quite a disturbing time for myself and for business. So I took down all my platforms, my, my um, website, and um, then spoke to Charlie, which took, took all the brunt of it, which is fantastic for me. Thanks, Charlie. Um, and then so just like went back doing it on social media again. But then I have basically just learned from it and yeah, show more of a, a, a story so that people see that you are a good animal, but it is being used, there's some good meat at the end of it, and not doing a dead animal with something stood behind it. It's, a, it's, a, it's like I say, it's a hoof or an antler. So you still got the, because us hunters, we want to see some antlers and some dead animals, because you know, that's what we go out and do, and we enjoy it. We enjoy hunting. Um, so we can't hide from the, the pleasure we get from it, but we're trying to be, we, I think we're trying to be more respectful to the outer, in public. Katie, there is a, um, a, a, you know, obviously a point of conflict here, and there is perhaps a sort of, a, a, we're coming to a kind of mainstream cultural solution. How would you like to see, I mean, you are an artist, how, how would you like to see game that has been shot depicted or not at all? Yeah, it's, it's difficult because I, I totally get the whole perception of someone that doesn't understand that world can just see a dead animal and someone smiling. It makes sense, it's not helping. But yeah, and I also get that people that are in that world do want to see that. So I think it's, it's got to be a, the right balance, it's got to be respectful of the animal, ultimately. And um, 
with a good caption that explains things because people read that. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's no good just being like, look what I shot type thing, boasting and rather than, you know, this is going to feed this many people and it's been real like, and supporting songbirds in our game crop and all of that. So I think more of an education approach, I think is important because people just like, why would you know about conservation if you've never lived in the countryside and never been involved in people that protect it? So there are artists, for example, now like Stephen Forwell, who, who do very beautiful uh, depictions of dead game. Yeah. Uh, is that offensive? Um, no, it's not offensive to me. I think it's a thing that I wouldn't choose to draw, but that's just my preference, really. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we, we, we have uh, two, two vegans and, and a professional deer stalker here, and, and we haven't hit each other yet. Just as a little show of oh, hands. This has been left clear, yeah, just in case we spread the veganism upon you. <laughs> it's not it's, catching, guys, it's not COVID. What do you mean? I, I feel like a tomato already. What, what, uh, what do you feel about uh, trophy shots? Should, I mean, the organisations are often, shooting organisations are often very good at coming together and saying, we, we believe there should be a, a, you know, we should not do this anymore. Do you think the organisations should come together and say, we should not be posting pictures of large four-legged animals with hunters in front of them? Does anybody think that at all? One, two, three, four, yeah. Okay, so we've got some more. Does anybody think we definitely shouldn't be making that statement? So we're actually, there is, there is a mood now towards, towards, towards what you're saying, which I must say, I'm, I've got a, one. I, I'm going to go over here with the, with the microphone. Hold on a second. You can't talk till I'm with you. I mean, yes, yeah, some of the photographs, say, from Africa, maybe should be turned down, but then it's the hunters and the hunter who maybe shouldn't be posting it worldwide. It should be sent between like-minded hunters uh, and, and fellow mates. Uh, than just sort of putting it on and it's flicking all over the world that somebody shot an elephant um, without, like the lady says, explaining why. I mean, a lot of elephants kill a lot of people in Africa, they trample the crops and they rely on the food. And so they then set snares to kill the animals, whereas uh, at least a bullet is near enough instantly. Um, but then if they're going to put um, a picture on, like, like you said, there should be some caption, you know, this was a, a crop raiding elephant that had to be culled, because, or it, it, it trampled so many people, you know, over a period of time. So a code of practice that includes something like backstory. I just want to throw that to Ryan, because you're about to go to Namibia, and they did very briefly uh, implement a ban on trophy shots, so the Namibian Hunting Association would, would oust you if you allowed your client to post a shot online. And it didn't work. It was it was impossible to police. So so they, they couldn't do it that way around. So uh, I mean, what you're asking for perhaps is a, a sort of sense of consensus amongst people like Paul on the hard left of the and me. Exactly. I mean, is is it doable? Can you can you see us actually being able to achieve this, Ryan? I mean, <laughs> no. But I do think it is something that people need to start. And we just saw it with the raise of hands there, that people are going to start being conscious about. I think what the awareness needs to be is, like, like I said, take the photo. There's nothing I don't, it's literally what the hunter is paid to do. Get the trophy, pay for the photo, set it up. That, that's grand, that's part of the process. But I think that's the, that's the shortest part of the whole process. It's like, but that's where the picture, the picture gets taken there and then the picture gets put out there. And, with and the they don't of, copy the caption. Exactly, the, cop, the caption's not copied, and it's, it's literally, you're playing into the hands of the enemy, really. You're saying, like, here's what we do with no comment or anything, have fun with it. And then, you know, I've said them quite a few times, but Born Free will get hold of that. That will get put in the Daily Mail, the Sun, the t every newspaper, um, and will get put with misinformation. And I think that's where it starts to do more damage, not just you know, hunting, but to Africa, um, or wherever the country is, but to Africa and the communities and the wildlife, because it gives more fuel to ban it. So I think there needs to be, there needs to be a culture change throughout it. But I, I, like I said, that's on both sides. That's on both from a hunter's point of view, but also we need to drill in to say, I think I said this to you on the show though, and the problem with animal rights activists or the vegan community, and I think you'll probably agree with me on this, is that the animal rights people and vegans don't care about wildlife they care about the animal 
that's what they care about. If the animal's got a name, they care about it. But they don't actually care about biodiversity. I've, I've rarely had a chat with a vegan that says, I care about, or, or say, yes, I think squirrels should be shot because you know they're decimating or they're dictating what trees we're allowed to plant because they'll eat the crap out of all the others. So I think that's, the, that's where me and you might come in, or vegans like us, where we yeah. go, we care about animals, but we also care about wildlife and biodiversity. And we see the difference between making it really personal, which is what Absolutely. a lot of vegans yeah. do. Yeah. And, and really, like, it's, it's not personal with, no. or maybe I'm wrong, but from what I, my research is, I don't see it as personal. I see it as, you know, someone wants to hunt. So like you said, there's an enjoyment out of it. There's, I like to do that. I like to see the process through. But the process of hunting, especially if we look in Namibia, is hunting is that, and then the post is that. It goes way off. And that is, and I'm not going to plug it now because it's not even made, but that's where my documentary, Beyond the Trigger, good title, um, is going to be exploring, going, what happens after the animal's killed? We, don't, we know how that happens. We don't need to look at that. It's lovely to see uh, vegans agreeing with each other. No, but it's really good to see vegans agree with each other that hunting isn't too bad. So thank you so much, Ryan Dalton, Katie Hargreaves, you can do it on her stand, and Paul Childley. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>